En un contexto de sequía recurrente en lugares como Colorado empiezan a preguntarse a quién pertenece la lluvia. Michael Hahnemann, prestigioso economista especializado en sostenibilidad, analiza los retos de la sequía y el derecho al agua tomando como ejemplo la situación de California y plantea la necesidad de un acuerdo global que garantice el acceso al agua de forma equitativa, racional y universal. So, thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. You are here in Madrid, invited by Cátedra Aquae to speak about a very important topic, drought of water and rights of water, uh, taking into account the recent events in California. What is going on? What happened? It was impossible to prevent it? The drought was caused by nature. And what's unusual about this drought is that for the first time, we have three really dry winters in a row. So this is the longest drought, the most winters without water. And the state is reacting in the strongest way in its history. There are only three times since 1850 where the state has interfered in the use of water. And the state has ordered users farmers and, sit and people in cities to cut their water use. Mm -hmm. 1977, last year, and this year. Mm -hmm. 1977 was a terrible drought. This drought is even greater. The same man was governor in 1977 as now. Jerry Brown was the youngest governor in California's history in 1977. He's now the oldest governor. He is the only governor who has intervened in water use. We have done, in California, a very bad job of enforcing water rights. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that story. Most people in California don't realize how bad it is. This year may be the first time we start putting our water rights in order. Fact is that last year was the hottest year in California on record. And so it could well be that this drought is due to climate change. We know that climate change will bring severe drought and long droughts in the future. Other Western states have done a better job of enforcing water rights, but all of the states will be challenged to deal with climate change. Um, and of course, in, in parts of Europe, Spain, other areas, the key challenge is this. First, you need good records on who is using water. Because if with climate change, there's less water in the river, you need a baseline to cut back the water use. Many places have bad records on who is taking water. California has extremely bad records. You need good records because you need a baseline it's a shortage. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need a system. If there is a particular year, a particular summer where it's, you need some system that comes into operation that allocates the remaining amount of, of water. These systems need to be prepared. It's like having an emergency response plan for water. You need to have this ahead of time because in a crisis, it's very difficult to work these things out. Everybody is upset and there's not a lot of time. Groundwater is a particular problem <coughs> in America and I think in some other places. Groundwater is regulated less well than surface water. I know Spain had uh, major reforms in the last 30 years uh, or so. Groundwater is treated in many areas as um, a windfall from heaven. I own this land. It's a miracle. There's water beneath it. And uh, the feeling is, this is a miracle. I benefit, mm -hmm. not other people. And so groundwater tends to be exploited and unregulated. So in California, the groundwater levels since last year are at the lowest levels ever recorded. And the low water table will last for many years in the future. 
it becomes more expensive to take groundwater in the future. What I would say as an economist is you need uh, clear property rights and property rights that are socially accepted. And then uh, somebody who has a property right to water should be free to do what he wants with the water, including grow almonds or grow other crops or lease his water right or sell his, his water right. The basic problem in California is the property rights are not clear and they're not enforced. And this leads to a chaotic uh, uh, situation. So the issue is not so much too many almonds. I mean, the, the issue is you have what are called paper water rights. That is, I say I have rights, you say you have rights, they total more water than was ever in the river. So these are, something is wrong with these rights. That is the problem that needs to be corrected on a large scale in, in California. Australia has had the most severe drought over the last 15 years. And Australia has been the most responsive in reforming water rights and making them effective really for climate change. Australia started 25, 30 years ago. And it's reformed water rights three times. It made changes. The changes were not enough. It made a second round of changes. They were not enough. It made a third round of changes. A key change Australia made is to go from absolute rights to proportional rights. So the traditional system in Australia, in uh, uh, the American West, is I have a right to a quantity of water. You have a right to a quantity of water. We have what's called seniority. So if my right dates back in time longer than your right, the way the system works is that the senior people take all their water until the river is dry and the junior people get nothing. So it's not a proportional sharing. Australia changed its water rights to a proportional system. I have a right to 1.5%. of the, You may have a right to 0.5%. If there's less, the state announces how much water is going to be in the river this year. I take 1.5% of that, you take 0.5%. If there's less water, we all cut back because we have proportional rights. In my mind, that's a fairer system of sharing water and a more rational system of sharing water. We all face the uncertainty because we all have percentages, but we don't know what the base is from which the percentages are computed. To change that was a big task in Australia, but it was done. In America, it will be a bigger task because of the extra legal rules in America. But that would be the, in my view, the rational way to prepare for climate change. Individual collection, you have a barrel, you collect uh, rainwater. So it turns out that's illegal. People with water rights, who are farmers and, they own the rainwater. Mm -hmm. If you put a, a collection device outside your house and you collect the rainwater, you're stealing the water that belongs to other people sort of downstream. Mm -hmm. Cal uh, so Colorado tried last year to pass a law that would legitimize small rainwater mm -hmm. collection systems in homes. Mm -hmm. It was defeated. They're trying again to uh, pass a similar law this year. I'm sure one day they will. But it illustrates this complexity of who owns the, who owns the rain? Yeah. And um, in a system, as in other Western states, with seniority, mm -hmm. if I have a water right since 1900, I believe the rain <laughs> since 1900 is also part of my water right. Yeah. And um, so it requires, in effect, a change in property rights. Impressive. The last question, because you have yes. to give the conference, and it's a little bit late, and they are related. Uh, how can we face climate change or 
Are we facing it in a good way? And what do you expect about COP21? Who knows what with, with COP21? What I expect is some sort of weak agreement involving voluntary commitments by member countries. Uh, if there's an agreement, it has to be something that uh, the parties agree to, and so it will be the lowest common denominator, the weakest that everybody can agree to. It will be a start. Will it be enough to stop uh, warming becoming dangerous? No. Um, and with climate change, the, the problem, particularly with water, is we have old property rights. Uh, and the basis is the assumption that the climate is unchanging. Whatever the history was, that determines the existing property rights. Mm -hmm. And so finding the political will to adapt property rights to climate change for water is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're Thank very you very welcome. much.